You're listening to the Foreign and International Medical Graduate Show, a podcast to inspire physicians in the process of immigration to the United States and access to graduate medical education. We create meaningful and helpful content that motivates medical students and doctors throughout the world with the goal of creating a community that supports itself and gives feedback to each other, that stays updated with the most recent tips and advice on how to make it in America and become a successful resident or fellow in the speciality of your dreams. Dr. Alonso Osorio is board certified and residency trained in both emergency and family medicine and will be bringing you 20 years of his personal experiences, struggles and motivation. We'll be chatting with people like you to talk about the lessons they've learned along their personal path, how to make an impact and how we can all benefit from it. Also, we'll analyze the current resources available and how to benefit from them. Thanks for joining us. Please enjoy the show. Hello, superstars, and welcome back to the Foreign and International Medical Graduate Podcast. I'm very excited that I already completed 25 episodes, and why not to start a complete new series of interviewing skill uh, podcast episodes uh, about five or six of them is what I have planned. I have invited a very special, very well-renowned guest in medical education. And I have today Dr. Ted O'Connell. He's a very well-known uh, family physician across the world. And he is an educator, author, and innovator, and a speaker. He's currently the founding director of the Family Medicine Residency Program at Kaiser Permanente, Napa Solano, he also serves as the Associate Clinical Professor at the University of California, San Francisco School of Medicine, and an Assistant Clinical Professor at UC Davis and Drexel University Schools of Medicine. He uh, also founded the Kaiser Permanente Napa Solano Community Medicine and Global Health Fellowship, which is the first fellowship in the United States to formally combine both community medicine and global health. Prior to establishing the residency program and fellowship programs at Kaiser Permanente in Napa Solano, Dr. O'Connell served as a faculty member and associate program director and then residency program director at Kaiser Permanente Woodlands Hills. While, I, while at Kaiser Permanente's Woodland Hills, Dr. O'Connell established the Kaiser Permanente Community Medicine Fellowship Program which now has expanded to eight fellowship positions across six different medical centers. He also served as the Board of Directors of Southern California Permanente Medical Group. And Dr. O'Connell is highly accomplished. Uh, he also went to medical school, an undergrad degree from the University of Notre Dame, uh, where he graduated with honors, and uh, med his medical degree from the David Jaffin School of Medicine at UCLA. He completed his internship, residency, and chief residency at Santa Monica UCLA Medical Center. And... Why not to say he has many, many more degrees, but specifically he has a large amount of publications. He has uh, participated in many uh, uh, books uh, as a writer, as an editor, and he uh, has a passion for medical education. He uh, was kind enough to join me today to bring you some kind of behind uh, the curtains high yield information for all of those international medical graduates that are seeking to come into America and are realizing that probably interviewing skills and the interviewing process could be remarkably, remarkably difficult. So Dr. O'Connell, thank you for joining me today. And after that in, uh, introduction, uh, I don't know if there's anything left for me to say about your very, very productive medical career. Well, Dr. Osorio, thank you for having me on your podcast. I'm hopeful that I'll be able to bring some value to your listeners. I do a talk on a regular basis at some of the local medical schools on the topic of interviewing skills and kind of preparing for the entire process uh, of interviewing for residency programs and have boiled uh, some of those down into blog posts that, that exist on my website. So if anybody wants to look at those after the show is over, uh, the, ad the, e the website address is tedxoconnell.com. I, I can get that to you so you can put it in the show notes. 
what I wanted to do is expand what I'm doing at the local schools to be able to provide those to students across the country and across the globe so they can have access. And really, you said it right uh, about kind of pulling the curtain back and, and showing people what's happening on the side of the residency program so they can prepare optimally. Um, what, if you don't mind, uh, you had mentioned a couple of my books. I, I do want um, your audience to know that I'm trying to put these books out into podcast format to make them widely available, free of charge. Uh, and, and really the intent is to be able, so that students can study on the go while they're commuting or doing chores or exercising so they have a little bit more time in their lives. So uh, USMLE Step 2 Secrets, which is my best-selling book, is available uh, as a podcast. You can get it on uh, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, Google Podcasts, uh, Podbean, wherever you like to get your podcasts. And Crush Step 1 is being released as we speak in separate episodes. So whether you're studying for step one or step two, we have a podcast available for you. Of course, the books are out there as well. I know so it's amazing. Thank you for that space. No, 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 absolutely. And that's how actually I, I, I got uh, to, to follow you. I've been listening to your USMLE Step 2 Secrets uh, podcast, and I think you're about to complete 125 episodes or more. Yes, it's somewhere in that neighborhood. I'd have to look to see how many episodes there are in total. I had taken each chapter and broken them down into about half hour chunks so that they'd be a little bit more digestible. And so that, you know, 45 or so chapters ended up making for over 100 episodes. So, you know, maybe a little bit um, broken up in terms of each chapter, but I wanted everybody to be able to just listen in 30 minute chunks like you would with a, a TV program. Awesome. Dr. O'Connell, I know you, you are a very, very busy person, but how do you come up with this extensive, deep passion in, to develop into medical education? Where was that born uh, from? Well, my, my grandmother was a teacher, so I, I, and um, several other family members have been involved in education, so I, there's probably something in the bloodlines there. Um, I also just realized during the course of my own education that I really enjoyed that process of teaching during uh, my undergraduate years when I was in college. During two of the summers, I went back to my high school and actually taught high school science courses for summer school and, and was, you know, I think kind of igniting those interests early on. And, and then as I went off into medical school, I realized that as a third and fourth year medical student, I had some knowledge to be able to give to the first and second year students and, and as a fourth year student to give to the third year students. And I just enjoyed that process. And the more I've done it, the more opportunities have opened up. I, I personally enjoy that process of professional development and being part of knowing a student from early on in their, their medical school career and watching them become more and more skilled and confident and becoming a first year resident and kind of starting over, you know, in terms of being a, a brand new doctor and, and learning that process. And then eventually seeing them graduate from residency and become colleagues and seeing the great work that they're doing in the world. It's, it's just very professionally satisfying to me to be, even if I'm just a very small part of that process. And I'm super excited about the fact that um, you're a family physician and like I am. And uh, despite the fact that I currently do not practice uh, family medicine, I try to uh, keep my knowledge as much as I can and uh, try to get, keep my credentials uh, up to date. Dr. O'Connell, when you decided to become a family physician, for most of our listeners, um, they don't really understand what family medicine is like, what kind of a specialty we are in America and what we represent. I want to probably bring a little bit of feedback on to what we are, what we do, and how important we are for the healthcare system in America. Yes, well, even starting from that last statement that you make, I believe that primary care and, and family medicine in particular is really the backbone of healthcare in America, um, alongside with, our, you know, of course, our internal medicine, pediatrics, obstetrics and gynecology, and psychiatry partners. Those are kind of the bedrock of, of healthcare in the United States, and hopefully someday across the world. 
in terms of the scope of practice for family medicine, we take care, uh, we really start before birth with doing prenatal care, uh, taking care of babies, infants, children, teenagers, young adults, middle age, and the elderly. Uh, we can work in the outpatient clinics, in labor and delivery, in the hospital, doing, we do procedures. Uh, many family physicians will work in urgent care centers or in the emergency department, which I believe is what, what your career is focused on. Yes, sir. And you can also do a blend. You know, some people do it all and some people do pieces of that. Um, you know, it depends where you are and where your interests are. It's a really, really unique field. It's very broad and can be challenging to learn it all. And, and But it's also very exciting. No, no day is like the previous. And when you open a, a, an exam room door, you never know what challenge you're going to be faced with. There's very definitely a public health component to what we do and very much a focus on the communities we serve and how social determinants of health like poverty and access to healthy foods and the environment and adverse childhood experiences and how all of those things and many more come together to affect one's health. And, and by being part of a community and by taking care of multiple generations and families and, and knowing the community you serve, I believe you, you are able to take better care of people and you develop these long-term relationships where you get to know people better and better. And that just naturally leads to better healthcare outcomes in my point of view. But it's a, it's a really dynamic field. You can change your approach to your career, sometimes multiple times throughout your career if you wanna do that. It can become more focused, it can become more broad. Uh, you can do different things entirely. You can move into administration. You can be on the front lines and do 100% patient care. You can teach. Uh, it, it's just it's just a really dynamic field, and and it's brought me a lot of joy in my career. I n I know that for you, uh, you're you have you practice the full scope of family medicine. In in my personal experience, I think that I got a phenomenal training at the University of Nebraska Medical Center because it was an urban uh, underserved path. And um, due to the lack of other specialties surrounding me, I was that type of family medicine resident that got to do pretty much everything that I was allowed within my capabilities and my scope of practice and the expertise on procedures and so forth. So it could be a, re could be a remarkably fulfilling career, career. And me, when I worked in Iowa, I was remarkably impressed by the fact that sometimes two or three family physicians ran a whole town and they knew their community better than no one else. And the same thing, the community had a huge deal of respect for these family physicians and they were the, 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 the kings of the town. And, and, and that was rather impressive. For me, it was rather shocking to see the, the amount of uh, uh, support that the physicians had from the community, the great degree of, of respect. And I think we need more family physicians in the United States. I don't think there is sufficient enough of us to, to provide health care for the American society. Do you agree with that? Or do you think uh, um, it's the, the amount of physicians per capita in the United States is, is a fair proportion and relationship? Oh, absolutely not. You, you are 100% right. We, we need more physicians in this country. We very definitely need more primary care physicians and family physicians in particular this is uh, very much more so in rural areas. You see even bigger discrepancies between the size of the population and, and the need for primary care physicians, family physicians. So no, you're, you're absolutely right. There's a national shortage of primary care physicians in our country and it's, that shortage is just worse in certain areas than others. Uh, I do wanna clarify, I, I no longer do prenatal care or obstetrics. I've, I've, once I came out of residency, kind of by necessity, there, you know, there's only so many hours in the day. And with my teaching interests and writing interests, yes. I, I had to narrow it down a little bit. So I, I wanted for full disclosure, I want people to know. But a lot of my colleagues as family physicians are very actively doing prenatal care and, and obstetrics. And my own residents graduating from our program are going out and, and doing that in their careers. So Deliver that's absolutely the case. That's amazing. I actually, 
it is extremely joyful to do it, but it, it really takes a lot of time and you have to available, be available for your patients, especially when they go into labor. You know, you, you do. You, know, you do. That, that's kind of interesting. So now let's, let's try to dig into the meat and potatoes of uh, the reason why I want to bring you here. Uh, so as a program director and having to deal with thousands of applicants through the interviewing season, you just finish your match process. Obviously, um, how, how did that go for you guys? And, and were you able to, f to fill all your spots and how big is your program? We were, yes, our residency program is six residents per year, so 18 total, and then plus a community medicine global health fellow. We have been uh, very fortunate. We launched the residency program seven years ago and were, and I think designed it really, really well and promoted it well and, and, and built it the, the way I think a program should be built. And so we've been successful right from the start with our matches, uh, have had seven very, very successful matches, including this year. We're very excited to be working with the group that's coming in. Hopefully, you know, we're in the middle of this pandemic that's affecting uh, residency training, but I'm hopeful that by July 1st, we'll be getting closer to normal. But yes, we had a, a, a really great match. Do you have a, a mix of uh, national grads, foreign medical grads, or how, how that works for you guys? This class is all um, U.S. graduates, and I'm trying to think through to think the allopathic and osteopathic mix. I'm going to hold back on my comments on that since I don't have the roster in front of me. I want to make sure that um, I think this year they are all allopathic graduates, but we, we usually have a mix of both. Yes. I, I know family medicine sometimes becomes that open door and probably an opportunity for immigrants like me as a foreign mm -hmm. medical grad to make it into a healthcare system in America. Uh, I, I want to make sure that, and that's why I ask you to speak what family medicine is all about, because I know that many physicians come from other countries sometimes with a background of having another specialty, and then they have to say that they, quote unquote, have to settle for for family medicine, but uh, I think I feel extremely proud of what I, I had accomplished as a family physician. I, I might not be the most well-renowned specialist on the left gray toe for, you know, the lefty people, you know, I, I, but the amount of knowledge that we need to have is quite large. So when, when, when a foreign medical graduate wants to come into America and become a family physician, what, what do you think in your experience are the odds of having a successful match? Well, I think that actually depends on a lot of different factors. And, you know, even before I break that down, you know, this idea of settling for family medicine, that idea doesn't settle well with me. You know, there, clearly there are people who want to get into a very, um, very selective field like orthopedics or radiology or dermatology. You know, there, there are specialties that are very, very competitive and some of them may not end up with the grades or the board scores that those specialties kind of require. And for them, they may view it as settling for a primary care specialty. But there are also thousands of graduates every year who see the value in primary care and family medicine and, and see how dynamic it can be and the breadth of it and the relationships with patients and you know, every year I interview 130 graduates or, you know, soon to be graduates who are applicants to our program. And they're some of the best and the brightest coming out of their medical schools. So, you know, there's kind of this dual nature to it. So um, I, I think I would really encourage people to try to do whatever specialty it is that, that you're most passionate about, because over a 30 year career, we want you to be happy and, and successful and fulfilled. Um, in terms of your your question about the chances for a match, you know, it, it really depends on a lot of different factors. Um, it can depend on grades. It can depend on board scores. It can depend on your previous experiences. It can depend on whether you've had a career in healthcare fields that may make you a more attractive applicant. It may depend on um, what medical schools you're, you've you've what medical school you've gone to it can also depend on where you're applying. And I think there should be some real strategy around this. Um, there very definitely are more competitive areas for family medicine residencies, California, 
Oregon, Washington states are all competitive areas and um, it may be less competitive in, in some in some of the less populated areas. You know, people want to come. Uh, there are a lot of Californians who go out of state for medical school and then want to come back home. And so you get this big desire for influx that and that and the, and the strength of our training programs helps make us um, very competitive you can also get really outstanding training and sometimes more full spectrum training if you get outside of the some of these western states where it's more competitive and so that's one strategy that an applicant can really use um, so I, I hesitate a little to answer your question because it's not there's not a cookie cutter thing where i can say like what will make you a competitive applicant because there's so many different factors that go into it it, it is it is not easy and and i suspect that uh you know, for, for the amount of positions that you have, you interview about 160 people. How many applicants do you get? I've heard something unreal in the numbers of 1,500, 1,200 in certain primary care programs or even more. Yeah, I think some of it probably depends on the size of the program. We get right around 1,000 applicants every year. So it's, it's a very competitive process. So how do you think um, of an international medical graduate could... Uh, go through the whole process? What are, you, in your personal experience, some tips of advice that you can tell someone, hey, before you even attempt to come here and look like a, a fool, you need to brush up on the following aspects. And what are the most common things that you see as red flags of applicants that do not look good on, either on paper or once they show up and they get an interview opportunity? that they don't look good in person, things that they don't, don't, that don't make them look good in person during the interviewing process. Yes, so even before we get to the interviewing process, you know, our residency program takes a holistic approach to reviewing applications and actually reviews each one. There are programs and, uh, you know, for the sake of efficiency that do set filters in the ERAS application process and some of those are, you know, the one of the easier ones to filter is with board scores. So the better you can do on your step, I know step one is going to pass fail soon, and, and that has particular implications for international graduates. Um, but the better you can do on step one until that goes pass fail, and the better you can do on step two, you know, th that performance, it's just one of the measures that programs use, but it does get used as a filter. So you know, having some focus on that, uh, having, if you have an opportunity to have experiences in the U.S. healthcare system, uh, that makes residency programs feel more secure about you as, as an applicant that you will know how to, you know, what, know what our system looks like and know how to function within that system. Uh, so that, you know, that is a challenge to even be able to get that type of experience. So I don't want to say that it's necessary but if you're able to make that happen, that can be helpful. Uh, you know, as another marker for that, if you're able to get some experience in another kind of, uh, you know, in Canada or, or a healthcare system that at least has some similarities to ours, we just really, because what programs want is they want somebody who's able to come in on July 1st when residency starts and be able to be functional and doesn't require a lot of extra training to kind of get them ready because, you know, U.S. medical students have had their third and fourth years of medical school that have prepared them. And, and you want uh, any, an international grad who's coming into your program to be fairly adept and kind of similarly ready to go. And um, when, when you said that, uh, the experience in the healthcare system in the United States, I personally did myself about uh, 12 to 16 months of observerships. Uh, Back 22 years ago, they were not that expensive. They were about $100 a month. I know that uh, I heard some applicants are paying up to $2,000, $3,000 for a four-week rotation, which I can consider rather outrageous. But do you, do you think observerships for a foreign medical graduate would offer that opportunity of having experience in the healthcare of the United States or, or you don't think it's well seen in paper or at least is something that you try to accomplish before you apply no, actually, having an observership does have some uh, utility because it's, you know, in your case, 12 to 16 months of exposure to our system and seeing how things work and 
you know, medications are different in different countries. So, you, you know, you hear the medications that are being used, it gives you a chance to focus and study on those, to see how orders are placed, to see how, you know, uh, the, our insurance system works. It's just more experience. Now, I do have, I, I was aware that observerships in some areas cost money and the amount that you're telling me is, is shocking and, you know, just not fair in my, in my own view. And especially considering that some students, depending where you're coming from, you know, two to $3,000 is a lot of a month is a lot of money in this country and in other countries, like that's a barrier to entry really. And, and, quite unfair. Um, I, there's a medical student that I've done some writing with in the past who's actually working on creating, a, a, and I believe it's an app to connect preceptors with students to get around some of the, to reduce significantly the costs of, of getting observerships and rotations. So I'd like to give you offline, I'll give you his name in case you want yeah. to put it in the show notes and it's his a, contact information. He's a friend of mine, Chase DeMarco. He's fantastic. Yeah. Oh, you know him. Good. Chase is the bright, one of the brightest persons I ever met. He's not oh. only a great medical student, doctor to be, PhD candidate, and he, he really has these mnemonics, medical mnemonics down to, to the yeah. perfection. That's good. I didn't know you knew him and I don't know where, if his app has actually launched, but I'm hopeful that that will um, help reduce the costs uh, of getting rotations eliminate, for students. Eliminate the middleman and probably kind of really help people like yep. me that had difficulties at the very beginning finding observership. So yes. you said a little earlier that the new change in, uh, of a step one from moving uh, from a numeric score into a pass-fail score will bring its own challenges for FMGs. Could you, could you explain yourself a little bit on that? Yes. You know, I think some of the intention around having step one go from, you know, a score to pass-fail is to reduce some of the pressure associated with it and address some of the wellness and burnout issues that we see amongst medical students and is intended to, fo you know, a lot of the focus in the first two years of medical uh, school in the United States, students have really focused their attention on doing well on that exam and maybe less so on truly understanding the material or, or taking the coursework that their universities offer and instead putting that focus on step one. And so the, the intent, I think, is really to address those issues. For an international medical student, Step one, by being having a score attached to it, is an opportunity to do well on that exam and be able to show residencies, hey, I did really well on this exam, and I, you know, that's something that you can use to compare me directly to, compare me directly with a U.S. student. You know, a 240 from an international student and a 240 from a U.S. student kind of gives you that apples to apples comparison. And if I'm an international student, you might not be familiar with my medical school, or you might not know exactly what my clinical rotations looked like in, in medical school, or you might not, you know, my research might be in a different language, and so you can't look at it that in detail, but I have the score that gives me something to be compared to, and suddenly that score is gone. And, and, and so it kind of takes away something from an international student that they could use as as an opportunity to get their foot in the door and have an opportunity for an interview. And in doing so, it puts more pressure on step two, because now you're in a situation where you have a single score with step two instead of two scores. And a student who didn't perform as well with step one and then significantly improved with step two could say, look, I, I, I learned how to be better at taking these tests and step two is more clinically focused, and you're all, we're all, everybody's training doctors, and step two is probably a more important exam to reflect what your actual clinical knowledge is. And, and so showing an improvement from step one to step two could be you know, something that could actually help you, especially if your step one score wasn't as strong, and now you just have this one moment to, to take with step two. So th that's what I meant in terms of some of the challenges that, that exist. It could, it could become sometimes uh, losing a, one of the steps could become a red flag. So I know that also the interview 
and getting to know someone face to face is to try to uncover or discover potentially red flags. And by saying red flags, we want to try to identify potentially candidates that are willing to succeed. And we want to really make sure that, you know, those applicants have, no, they don't have behavioral issues, that they're able to interact with other people, that, as you said, they're accustomed to the healthcare system, is someone that you would be willing to mentor and teach over the next three to five years, that is someone that you feel that could be a good team player in the residency program. Uh, any other red flags that you think you could unveil or try to kind of sort through during the interview? Yes, during the interview, I mean, you really hit on a lot of those. Is You, you want to make sure that, or at least try to assess whether somebody is going to make a good resident and then and thus a, a good future physician. And, and really, you're just trying to assess, do they have those interpersonal skills and will they likely have the good bedside manner? And do they have the ability to communicate clearly? Do their answers to your questions suggest that they are going to be a good team player and, and not just focused on themselves? Uh, you try to assess, are they going to be a hard worker? You try to assess, you know, is, are their interests within family medicine or, or whatever specialty you're talking about, are their interests consistent with the way you're training your residents? Um, you you want to make sure, you know, there's a lot, you, you mentioned the behavioral piece, but you're, yeah, you're trying to pick up on, could there be a personality disorder or anything in there that could make them challenging? Uh, it really, what you, when it boils down to it is, are they going to be a good team player? Are they going to be somebody that you want to have on your team? Like, I would even go so far as to say, like, when you're not working, are they fun to be with? Like, that just general sense of how do they fit in your group? And, and would you want this person as your own physician? Many of my um, listeners uh, are remarkably concerned about their spoken English. and. Obviously, they sometimes have fantastic board scores. They get invited to an interview, and suddenly, due to fear, they literally mentally block, and the English just doesn't flow. And that obviously comes as a potential barrier to be screened out of potentially having a successful match. Is that correct? It could be. I mean, you know, it depends on the population of the community where the residency program exists. Uh, at the same time, in the United States, English is our primary language or our, fir our first language. Um, I should say our national language. Um, and so you do want your the applicant to be able to communicate effectively with their patients and with their colleagues and attending physicians in English. At the same time, you know, there's a lot of data that a physician who is communicating with a patient in his or her native language is going to be uh, much more effective. You get better health outcomes. Absolutely. You get better buy-in from the patients in terms of treatment plans, more adherence with taking their medications, just a better communication. You know, when you're, when you're communicating in your primary language, uh, there's there's a lot of nuance that exists in there and yeah. and that you know that is very very important in healthcare where there's nuance to the communications that we're doing and so i would encourage people too like if if spanish is your first language and you're much more comfortable yes you want to be able to present yourself in english um during an application process and and just generally for in healthcare but you might also want to look at residency programs that are in a location where there's a higher Spanish speaking patient population, because in those environments, your abilities in that language uh, are, are going to be very highly valued. And you could yeah. say the same thing, what, you know, if Chinese is your first language or Tagalog is your first language, look for those programs that have patient populations that are more reflective of your native language, because you're probably going to be a, a stronger candidate in those areas. Yeah, that, that was the case for me. And that's why I thrive in my urban underserved program, because we run this huge clinic that was federally funded and privately funded. And 99% of my population was uh, Mexican, Latino. And for me, it was 
amazing to serve them well because language is so much more of the spoken language is the nonverbal component, the religious component and other things. Yeah. And I will tell you, they got better care from you because you're a native Spanish speaker than they would have from me, who's a native English speaker and trying very hard to learn Spanish. But as somebody who's not native, there, there really just is a lot of nuance that I don't pick up on. And your ability to speak Spanish uh, 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 fluently and natively provides better health care. There's no doubt in my mind. So for our listeners, look out for those programs in which you think you potentially will be relating better with your people, you know, your ethic, your, 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 your background, cultural background. Dr. O'Connell, another question that has come up is like the issue of having a gap that you cannot really explain in the, in the, in your process in between the moment that you graduated from medical school to the moment that you're interviewing. One of them, I'm going to give you an example. This person was not making enough money in her country due to the way it is, $500,000 a month. It was not even enough to make a living. And she found another way to make more money doing something else. Do you think being humble and honest about that gap and the reason why you had to step away from medicine is, is the way to go? Or what do you recommend to those people that have huge gaps that could not be easily explained? Well, I would say first, you do need to be able to explain your gap. You know, a residency program doesn't want to, a gap is fine, an unexplained gap is not. We want to make sure that you didn't just decide to take two or three years off because you were burned out or that you were in prison, you know, or, you know, it, the, the mind goes to, makes up all, likes to fill a vacuum, right? And so if we don't know why you had that gap, that potentially is a red flag. I think owning it, you know, is, is the example that you give. If you have somebody who's in their home country, or I would say the same thing for a U.S. medical graduate, if you had to take a year off because you couldn't afford medical school or two years off and, and had to work and save and even work in something that's not a medical field and you then save you know got in a better situation where you could resume your studies to me that's a very compelling story and yes you have to be humble in telling that story but i also think you should proactively own it and be be proud to share that story um, our, our residency program looks for people like that. We have a diversity and social justice committee that is part of our interviewing and match process and looks at what we call distance traveled, which mm -hmm. is looking for people who have had hardships in their life and who didn't come from privilege and who have overcome hurdles to get where they want. As I look at it, that's somebody who's worked tremendously hard to be to get to where they are in their healthcare career. They are passionate and committed about what they want to do, have overcome hurdles so that the next hurdle that comes up isn't necessarily going to, you know, cause them as much um, stress as somebody who hasn't had to come overcome those hurdles. And it's shown their co commitment to their career. And it's shown that they really want to be a physician. And it's, you know, you can probably make some assumptions that, you know, if, if a patient of theirs is having similar issues, they can relate to that and, and help their patient through those difficult times in their life. And if a patient isn't getting the care they need, that person may, that physician may be more of an advocate for that patient than somebody who's, who's never really had those stresses. So I think there's a way to take those things and, and really tell the story of who you are and where you've been and what you've overcome and how passionately you want to be a physician and, and make that a, a strength. I heard from someone that uh, having had setbacks in your life doesn't make you uh, less of a person, actually might become... Makes you more of a person. Advantage. Huh? I think it makes you more of a person. It makes you a it, better it, person. Having I think had it a gives setback. you more, more resilience, more tools in order to deal with adversity, uh, more perspective. It, it's, I, I think that stuff is, um, 
I, I would rather personally, I, I would be more inclined to have somebody like that than somebody who's been a lifelong student and never had to work and never held a job. You know, it's somebody who's got some, some life history and has overcome adversity is, uh, how you have handled, a better applicant. Yes. How you have handled past experiences might re resemble how you're going to handle future challenges and future interactions. I guarantee you that a well-informed program director or faculty member who's conducting an interview and hearing a story like that is making that assessment as they're talking to you and saying, oh my gosh, this person has, come, has overcome so much and has persevered so much to become a physician. They are going to be successful as, as a resident. They're going, you know, when, when things get difficult, they are not going to stumble over things. They're going to make, out, make an outstanding physician. You know, that's kind of the assessment that's going on. So you might as well embrace your, 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 your own history and tell that story and, and use it as a strength. You're, you're just looking for that good fit. And that, that's all probably what you're looking for. That kind of person will just enrich your program even more. It will mm -hmm. enrich your, the culture of the program. It will enrich the organization. It will enrich the community, the residency culture. Everything about it will make that program probably is stronger by having somebody that has so much background and diversity, you know? A hundred percent. I agree with you a hundred percent. And uh, so for our listeners, that's just golden information. We're just looking for that good fit. Dr. O'Connell, and a few things that you have seen through your career that are big no-nos on applicants that just come up unprepared for an interview and, and outrageous things that you have seen uh, that probably come to your mind. Probably, I don't want to make you probably be on the spot because you're an, an active residency program director, but things, red flags that you are like big no-nos of an applicant that is coming for an interview. Absolutely. So you said at first uh, about being prepared. You, when you go in for an interview, you should be prepared and, and you should have done your research and looked at the residency's website so that you know some details about the program. Uh, if somebody asks me a question that is on page one of our website during an interview, that's just a, sure, a sign to me that they're not particularly interested or that they don't prepare well. And we all want residents and doctors who, who prepare, right, and read the chart. I, I, you, you kind of, again, you make assumptions that, well, if this person's not ready for the interview, they're either that, not that interested or they might not do the, the work that's necessary to be a really good doctor. So being prepared. Uh, another no-no is being impolite or unprofessional to anybody. And we've all heard stories of applicants who are rude to the residency coordinator or rude even to a parking attendant or you know, somebody that you think is not connected to the residency program. But you never know that a faculty member or program director may know that security guard or, or parking attendant very well. We all um, care about our co residency coordinators. We all talk. And so, if, you know, it's, it, if you're rude or unprofessional to anybody, that's just to us a sign of how you're going, who you, how you might be to the nursing staff or the janitorial staff or a respiratory therapist or you name it. So, Assume you, you're on, you are on your interview day from the time you get in your car or get on the bus to the time that day is over. You, you just never know who you're, who you're going to cross paths with. So be, be professional at all times. Um, Dressing attires. Um, yes, dress professionally. Dress professionally. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's good information on websites about how you should dress, but, you know, a suit of some kind and, and, you know, for men, that's pretty standard for, for women. It, it, you know, it's usually a professional um, jacket and either a pair of professional pants or, or a skirt and a blouse. Um, you know, I'm not an expert on, on women's dress. Um, it's kind of one of those things where you know it when you see it, that it looks professional or not. Um, but you know, for men, a nice shirt, a tie for both men and women, you know, shoes that are nicely polished. You want to make sure your clothes are pressed. You just want to, you, you want to look professional. And, and I would say, aside from taking my advice, get, get the details from a website about how to, how to dress professionally. 
Absolutely. Um, but it's about looking like um, like you're there to be a professional and and that you're going to be a future doctor. That's awesome. For for me, I'm gonna tell you when I walked into my first uh, set of interviews, one thing that I found remarkably overwhelming was that when you have an average of 15 to 30 minutes, depending who you're meeting, if it's the chairman, the program director, probably you have more time with them, but usually you have 15 minutes to meet with our junior or other faculty staff or other senior residents. That whole dynamic of a speed dating was overwhelming for me. I never done it before. Uh, I felt that potentially my English had to come across in a faster way that I had to show off my entire life in those 15 minutes. And, I don't know, I felt frustrated. I felt that sometimes I didn't say what I had to say. Nervousness took over. What do you think you're expected to hear from the person on the other side when they come to your office, when they open that door and they see Dr. Ted O'Connell sitting on the other side of the desk? Or if you want, go for a walk or, you know, whatever you do, your interviews. I don't know, because there's many styles of interviewing. But in your case... What, what do you, would you say to the person on the other side to kind of mellow down and cool off and chill out before they come in? Well, I think it gets, part of it gets back to what, what I was talking about, about preparation. And by preparing, it, it, it will, by nature, if you prepare well, it will reduce your stress levels and it will make you seem more polished and more professional. And so I would recommend that well in advance of any interviews that you start to practice and you're not practicing to get to the point where you're, you're, you seem like an actor or an actress, but really just so that you have some comfort with the types of questions that you're going to be asked. And maybe you and I could do another episode where we go through some of those. I do have them on, on the blog on my website and it captures the, I don't remember how many there are 30 or 40 most common questions and I would suggest that you familiarize yourself with those questions. You think about how you might respond. You may even make some notes about how you might respond to those types of questions and then practice them with a friend or a family member. You know, that family member doesn't have to be, or the friend doesn't have to be in medicine to be able to help you with that. Some of it is just getting comfortable with how you're going to respond to those questions you can record yourself and, and watch what you're doing. Um, some of us fidget or have body movements that, that show stress, or you may see that your posture is not that great or that you're, the way you're responding is coming really fast because you're nervous or it's coming really slow because you're giving things a lot of thought. But by doing this and kind of going through these questions several times each, you could get much more comfortable with them and, and it gives you a chance to think through how you, how you want to respond and how you want to be perceived. So I think that that's the best way to prepare. Uh, for somebody who's coming to interview with me, I, I really just want to have a conversation with them. And, and I may, you know, other faculty members or other program directors may be different and may have their set of questions that they want to ask. I want to get to know the person. And so I usually try to focus it around some of the details that are in their application and just get a sense of, you know, let them talk about their hobbies and, and talk about their interests and talk about some of the, the volunteer work or the research that they've done just so I can get a sense of what, what they are. And then I want to know what they're looking for in a residency program and what they think they'll bring to the program. And it's really ultimately about making sure that they're a good fit and that we think that they're going to be a great resident um, but it's for me more of a conversation than than peppering somebody with questions. And you're absolutely right on that. And probably everybody has heard this from me before. But when I walked into interview with Dr. Kelly O'Keefe in emergency medicine, I, he had a broken racket behind his head, broken that he was just kind of nailed into the wall. And I'm a I'm a big tennis player and a big tennis aficionado, and we connected over tennis, and this became the whole 15 and 20 minutes of, of the interview. And, and through the three years of a, a residency training program, we play probably 50 times in his house, in his backyard, in his own home tennis court. You just never know what's going to be that little connection that is going to make you like that person or make them a better fit for your program. 
Right. And that's why I often focus on those things. You know, there's one line in the ERAS application that asks about hobbies and interests. With every applicant, I try to get into that a little bit um, because that's often what makes somebody interesting. It's often a way to connect with somebody. Oftentimes I learn about, you know, hobbies that I didn't even know existed. And, and that's interesting to me. And if I'm, you know, if somebody's talking about what they're passionate about and I'm hearing about something that's interesting, we're likely to connect that way. And, and it just makes the, the conversation a little bit more comfortable for everybody. And before we wrap it up, I, I wanted to ask you, how, how important do you think is the personal statement for us as an, as an international medical graduate? I never had ever written anything like that. And when it came the time for me to do it, I just didn't know what it meant. I know that U.S. grads go through this for undergrad, for grad education, for med school, and they do this and they rehearse it over and over and over. How much of an importance do you give to the personal statement and what are you looking on a personal statement as a program director? Well, personal statements are important, but they're also not a deal breaker. Um, I, I, I view them as a, as a way for an applicant to kind of tell you a bit about who they are as a person. And, and it's really the introduction that's going to, you know, help get you in the door. And beyond that, it's probably not that important. Um, you know, when you read these, 80 or 90% of them sound fairly similar. Uh, and then there are a few that are really outstanding and a few that are bad. And, you know, you, you want to make sure you're not one of the bad ones. Um, but otherwise, you know, it, it's a chance if you have anything in your application that might be perceived as a red flag, it's a chance to address that because you, you know, if somebody sees a red flag and they don't have any more information, they may just not bother interviewing you. But if you take that and explain some of it in the personal statement and kind of own it and talk about, you know, say you didn't pass step one the first time, you, you can explain how, you know, if there was a, a circumstance in your life that affected it, you can explain that and it, or that you changed your study style and whatever the hurdle was, you, you addressed it overcame it and then did well on the second attempt. If you just put, explain that in one paragraph, it gives the, whoever's reviewing your application a chance to say, okay, that this is somebody who's professional. They, 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 they hit a hurdle and had some difficulty, addressed it, learned from it, grew from it, and it probably won't happen again. And, and that's really what we're looking for. Um, you know, you, you, you don't want to just repeat what's in your, in your CV or your resume, the, the rest of the application is there. So repeating it doesn't really help you or help whoever's reading it. So I would say, don't do that. Um, you want to be fairly brief and focused. It shouldn't go on for more than a page or so. Um, talk about your desirable qualities. Things that, uh, there's actually, I have a whole blog post on this too, if it, your, your listeners want to go look at that. Um, you know, you do want to get people's attention. You want to talk about what your desirable quality, why would they want to have you as an applicant to their program? You can talk about your communication and your interpersonal skills. Talk about what you think is going to make you a really strong resident or future physician. You can use it as an opportunity to talk about life experiences and how they influenced your career decisions. I do think one of the most important things to do is to use the the name of the specialty that you're applying to in that personal statement. Because we are seeing, Wonderful. especially in my specialty, seeing more and more people who are applying to multiple specialties. And really what we want is people who want to be family physicians. And so you should say, and I recommend that as people write their personal statements, you should, if, it's, if you're applying for family medicine, that word family medicine should be in the first paragraph. Because that one of the things I do is I look through, if I don't see my specialty in their personal statement, I assume they're probably applying to more than one specialty and that makes them less likely to get an interview with us. That's a great so, thing. Yeah. And so if you're, if you, and it's fine, if you want to apply to more than one specialty, go ahead and, and do that, but you should have two separate personal statements and the surgery or whatever it is. Um, one should say surgery somewhere very early on in the first paragraph and the family medicine one should say that. And, um, you know, make the, make the reader believe that you really want to be in their specialty. 
One one last comment for, uh, of a life experience. Dr. James Stageman, the former program director for the University of Nebraska Medical Center Family Medicine Residency Program, when he brought me over, he was remarkably concerned about the fact of what was going to be for Colombia living in cold, freezing Nebraska and not having any sunlight exposure for three to six months. And he was always checking on me every so often, every couple of weeks, about how I was coming along. How are you settling along? So are you finding friends in the community? Have you found your hobby? You've been able to play tennis. Uh, what are you doing to stay mentally healthy? Have you found an apartment yet? Have you bought a car? Where are you staying? Uh, are you dating anyone? I, I think culturization for me was the hardest thing to break through as an immigrant. Any, any uh, last comment on that? Well, I think you're very lucky to have a mentor at your program who cared so much about you as a person and was checking in on you and wanting to make sure that you yeah, were becoming part of the community and feeling settled and, you know, feeling supported and, and being well. So you're lucky. And I hope everybody has somebody like that in their, in their programs. Um, you know, if you get that, those questions, I, I think you can, you know, about, okay, how you're coming from this type of environment, our environment is very different. How are you going to adapt? That's just a chance to talk about how adaptable you are and give an example of something else where you've adapted in, in life and talk about how you're willing to embrace that, that experience of being in a different culture and a different type of environment and that you have strategies about how you're going to seek out community during your free time and that you have exercise in your life to keep yourself well and you know to just talk about what your strategies will be and that you're open to the experience and 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 then also talk about how much you think you can add to that community you know your the local community where you live and your hospital your you know your medical center based community that by being somebody with a different background and different experiences you think that it will be mutually beneficial um, you know, there's a, there's a way to take almost any question and make it sa and have your response be very positive. Well, Dr. O'Connell, you've been a wealth of knowledge. I know that it's a, it's an honor to have you come over and thank you for this quality time. Uh, you have given us a lot of good tips and this is just going to be a little introduction into what I have coming for the next five chapters. It, it's been a blessing to have you over. I know we've been in communications for the last probably two months trying to make it happen. And, and thank you for, for allowing me to come into your house and tap into your knowledge. And it's been fantastic, uh, full hour of just goodness of information all over. Well, it's been my pleasure. I, I really appreciate the opportunity to speak with your audience. And I hope that some of what I've had to say will bring them value and, and help them in their professional journeys you're doing great work trying to help the next generation of physicians uh, around the world. And that's really what I think we're, you and I both are trying to do is, is make sure that the next generation of physicians are outstanding. And, and so I thank you for the work that you're doing. Thank you, sir. Yeah, as I said earlier, our goal here in the Foreign and International Medical Graduate Podcast is to bring you free content to try to assist you on how to become successful in the process of becoming a physician in the United States and, you know, accomplish your dreams. Dr. O'Connell, I say goodbye for now and thanks for being here. And to all my listeners, please uh, be ready for the next five episodes that are going to be full of goodness on tips and just good stuff about the interviewing process. And we'll see you then in the next episodes. Thanks for listening and please follow me and leave me some good feedback. I appreciate it. <laughs>